All right, here we go. Jonas Rivera's intro of uh, Inside Out for the San Francisco State movie night. Hey, everybody. Welcome to movie night. Um, and thank you to the San Francisco State University family for calling on me to doing this, for having me. It's a great, it's a great honor. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud to, to be part of the family and really proud of this night and of this movie, Inside Out, which is, uh, other than my kids, the thing I'm most proud of in my life. So um, I'm, my name is Jonas Rivera. I'm a proud alum and uh, I'm a producer at Pixar Animation Studios and I, I uh, oversee production there now. I've produced a number of films, just finished Toy Story 4. The first film I produced was up. Uh, but the one I want to talk about tonight is Inside Out. And it's the, it's, you know, I love all of them, but uh, Inside Out is really special and meaningful to me. For one, it's a love letter to San Francisco. I think we could all relate to that. We wanted to make something that was, uh, I don't know, a fun, even though it's animated, a truthful representation of the place we live and where we, where we love. And, um, and so I would, I'd love to dig in. I'm excited you're going to watch it. I, I hope, I hope, uh, I hope I don't spoil it by going on and on. I could talk about Inside Out all day and all night. So, um, so bear with me, but, um, listen, as I said, you know, I, I, um, I come from San Francisco state. In fact, I kind of think my career started there because when I, when I was going to school there, you know, back in 93, 94, um, I, I, I realized how much I was in the cinema department and I, I you know, I was uh, one of those people that like, I love production. I love creation, but I knew I was kind of one of the one person in the class. I didn't raise my hand when it, uh, who wanted to be a director. You know what I mean? Like I love producing, I love putting on shows. I didn't know what that meant, uh, really, but, um, at, at schools, I was figuring it all out. I um, someone recommended that I reach out to Pixar because I loved animation so much. And again, I'm not an artist. I just, but I love animation. I always have. I sort of had dreams of working for Disney, and little did I know that there was a almost a a cooler like punk rock version of Disney in our own backyard. In those days, it was over Point Richmond, and um, they were at the time I knew them from, they were doing like commercials and things. And I didn't even know about Toy Story, which was in production when I was at school, but I, you know, I got the, the, the suggestion and I followed up on it and I probably from a pay phone on campus. I don't even remember. I cold called Pixar and, um, somehow got an, somehow got a, sort of an interview. It was, uh, less of a interview and more of a, uh, me asking if they had internships. They didn't even really have a formal program, uh, but they asked me to come down and, and get to work cause they needed help on, um, uh, on what would end up being toy story. So in kind of one of the luckiest days of my life, I went down there and started a career working a few days a week while I finished school. And, um, I guess careful what you wish for. I've never, I've never left. So it turned into a, a great place to work. I've been able to participate on a number of films. Toy Story was the first, you know, in the production. I was a PA. I worked on A Bug's Life. I worked on Monsters Inc. You know, cars. I apologize in advance for dogs barking and undoubtedly the kids that will run through here. So, um, but it is what it is, right? We're all <laughs> working from home. Um, but yeah, I ended up uh, hanging on there and and having a great time working on a lot of these films and. Um, Ultimately, uh, working on Monsters, Inc., I was partnered with Pete Docter, who's a good friend of mine and, uh, and a great director. He directed Monsters and, um, and then Up, and that's when I was first asked to produce. So I, I produced that film with Pete, and we had a great time, and, uh, and the crew did a great job, and then we were paired up again after that movie. In fact, that's when Inside Out was born. We finished Up, and we were kicking around ideas at Pixar, and I will never forget this because I'm a parent um, of – three young kids. Pete's, Pete has kids that are older at the time. And our co-director on Inside Out, Ronnie Del Carmen, had kids that were even older. His kids were in college. Pete's were in high school. Mine were young in grammar school at the time. And um, and one day we, we were in development and Pete, Pete um, came in and his daughter, uh, who I, I've known for years, is, is sweet looking. In fact, his daughter does the voice of, his daughter's name is Ellie and she does the voice for young Ellie in Up. And she's a lot like that kid, just full of life, full of energy. Um, I was always buzzing around the studio, just a real cool kid. And, um, you know, and she was eight, nine, maybe 10 years old. And then <laughs> she got to be 11 or 12, um, you know, her demeanor changed a little bit. And in fact, one day Pete came in and he's, uh, you know, head in hands. He said, ah, 
you know, Ellie, Ellie's, <laughs> it's hard to be a parent. He's given some story about how it's harder when your kids get older. And, um, he told us just these stories about watching her and watching her change from this happy, bubbly kid, still a great kid, but now all of a sudden she's got hoods on and headphones in and sitting in the back of the car and not, not bouncing around, you know, like the, the jumping bean that she was when she was a kid. And he literally to himself said, God, I wish I could understand what's happened inside her head. And literally that question, that sort of question to himself became the germ of, of, of the, of inside out, like the germ of the idea, like what, what, what if we could find a way to dramatize that? What if we could find a way to answer that question in an animated film? We started kicking that idea. And as parents, we lit up. We're always looking at Pixar. And I think anyone would tell you this, that if you could find a personal hook into what you're trying to make, that it's a lot, it's just more stable ground to try to put together a movie or, or tell a story. And that was ours. Like, what if we could tell um, a movie about a kid growing up kind of from the point of, well, from the point of view of her emotions. And, and we made sort of a parental analogy about it because we thought, wow, if you could do that right, you could create these characters that are perfect for animation, that live inside a little girl's head and, uh, and travel through imagination and dreams and memories and all these cool things. Uh, and they represent her and they, they want to care for her like you would, you know, for your child. And it just felt like we could, we could make something fun. And it also felt like... Um, it had really great potential for animation because we love, you know, we love animation. You know, we're students of the old Disney movies. And in fact, I remember um, when we were first pitching it, we, we even thought about it. Like, ah, if we do this right, it could be, you know, these five emotions. And it took a while to get to the five, but we thought it could be our version, Pixar's version of the seven dwarfs, you know, like grumpy or sleepy or something like really gettable, fun characters that, you know, maybe last, last forever. And that was, that was sort of the, the germ of the idea. We started to develop, develop it and figure out a, um, you know, what, what is the story and how do you dramatize it? And there's so many, there's so many little anecdotes to share. One thing we did is we, um, we got out of Pixar. We went over to, uh, uh, the, just to get, you know, sometimes we'll try to work off site and clear our heads and come up with a different environment. We went over to the Walt Disney family museums. We love it over there in the Presidio. And, uh, and at the time, Diane Disney Miller, who we loved and the whole, the whole family and everyone at the museum, I mean, we're just such Disney fans. We spent a lot of time there. And Diane let us use their conference room. So we set up a little story room in their conference room. Looks out over the Golden Gate Bridge. And we sat over there for a couple days and uh, started wrestling with the story. And then when you're putting together a story, um, the, you know, there are so many unknowns, so many variables. What's, you know, what's the characters? What are their names? What's the actual plot? This, that, and other. And all it is and is, is open-ended variables. And we were just kicking around ideas. And we walked out the back of the... Um, uh, back of the museum there in the presidio to take a little break or sit on the porch and we were for some reason we were calling the kid riley i think ronnie del carmen just started calling her, her girl riley we just were kind of going with it but it was just a placeholder and we walked out there and i remember sitting out there drinking coffee and i look and we're actually the museum the back of the museum's on riley lane <laughs> in the presidio so it's the first decision we made i'm like this is this is meant to be can we call her riley so that's why riley got her name we also um because we love the museum so much and we love Diane and, and, and the whole crew there, when we when we decided that Riley was gonna be a hockey player, we we, we built the, the hockey uh, arena where she practices and plays her games and Foghorns on, on the plot, kind of where the museum sits um, in San Francisco. So there's a couple of shots, establishing shots of that. And if you look close, that's kind of right, we fudged it a bit, but that's right about where the museum sits. That's our little thank you note to the, to the museum there in the Presidio. Um, but anyways, that's, that's where the story started coming together. We started really digging into this idea of this little girl. And I remember Pete pitching it this way, which I thought was so great. Like, what if you could tell the story of a little girl, uh, but she's not the main character. She's the set and the main characters are her emotions, specifically joy, because we kind of like this idea that when you're born, you're, you're full of joy, you're happy. And as time goes on, your other emotions you kind of come into effect and, and, and get some play, but really who this kid is, 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 is joyful. And, um, we just thought that was a really fun and movie worthy question if we could figure it out. And, and, uh, and, you know, slowly, but surely we did. We had a lot of fun developing the characters. By the way, there's a ton of debate, even, um, how many emotions are there? You know, there, you, we talked to scientists and neurologists and, um, psychologists and people, you know, there's, there's 10 key emotions or there's, seven someone said there's one there's so many numbers but 
there were always, and usually in, in, other than the person that said there was one, there were the five that we ended up with, which was you know, joy, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust. And they felt really key. Uh, and they, they also felt right, like you could have fun with that group. And um, joy clearly was going to be the main character and the one that was in charge and that was going to be the one that, without knowing, it was steering Riley into all these social storms at school, which felt truthful um, and honest. And, you know, we, we did a lot of uh, debating about what Riley's story was going to be, like what the external story was. Um, how do you get real high stakes out of it? You, you want the stakes to feel life and death, but we didn't want to make a dark movie about, you know, depression or anything. But we stumbled upon, and partially because my wife, uh, um, there's a lot of reasons, but my wife's, my wife grew up as a Navy kid. Her dad was an admiral. She was moving every Every, I never moved. I lived in the East Bay my whole life. I still do. And my wife, everywhere we'd go, she'd be like, oh, I lived here once. I lived here once. And I remember telling that story to Pete and it felt like she still talks about it to this day. So clearly moving as a kid, especially like junior high or when you're 11, um, has a great impact. So that felt like a really great way to have what feels like emotionally, like life and death stakes to a kid, but really it's, it's not. Um, that felt like a good balance. So again, these things where you reach for like personal things to put in these pictures so that they, whether people like them or not, you know, you can kind of say they're truthful. Um, and from that point, you know, just developing the, the, the theme and the story and, um, and the five characters casting was a lot of fun. You know, I, I remember anger was, I think first where we had Pete pitched the idea of anger and he even drew him as a little square brick and he, th he we thought oh, well Lewis Black he Pete said Lewis Black would be perfect for that and I remember when we called Lewis Black and showed him that character if you know Lewis he's just a great comedian and makes a living out of basically being angry he actually mocked us for <laughs> casting him I think he said well that's real brilliant guys real real out, out of the box thinking on this one but he jumped in and he's a dear friend and we love him but it, it was it was just a it was just great we you know Mindy Kaling as Disgust was a fun Disgust was an interesting character because um, we struggled with, with her. I, I never really thought of disgust as an emotion. Uh, I thought of it more as a reaction, but it turns out it is an emotion. And through the research, we, we found that all the emotions, you know, all of our emotions, that there's a reason that you have them, right? That may sound obvious sort of academically, but when we were playing around with the story, like there's a reason why you have fear. If you get, um, you know, when you're a kid, if you get bit by a dog, and now forevermore you develop a fear of dogs. Well, that's a protective mechanism. So, um, or if you eat something that you don't like, you, you spit it out, that's disgust. Again, it's a self-protective protective mechanism. And sadness is the same. Sadness helps you slow down and reboot. And, uh, and that one, because it was a little less obvious, felt like, oh, that's an interesting one to play because Joy wouldn't understand that at all. So the science of and the research we did with a lot of smart folks helped us to figure out the right way to, to maybe, maybe dramatize it. And it started because of that, we started this debate about the theme. And I'm so sorry if I'm boring everyone, but uh, um, it was, it was a, a lot of fun. We, we had this debate. The movie was always this love letter to our kids. And so we sort of had this almost Peter Pan-esque theme of like fighting growing up. If Joy could, Joy loves Riley so much, we always thought that if she could, she would freeze time and never let her you know, grow up. And as parents, it's sort of related I, I certainly relates to me. That's clearly the wrong thing to do. You can't do that, nor should you. But I think at some level, everyone kind of understands that. And Joy kind of lives by it. Um, and so we had this idea, well, that's that's the, the theme of the movie. And as we were developing it, it became, well, no, maybe the theme is more about accepting what you are resistant to accept, in this case, sadness. You know, maybe that's a deeper theme. And uh, yeah, we had these internal debates about what is it? Is it a movie about growing up or is it a movie about accepting sadness? And one of the things that, that's part of, the, as, as you develop and m make these movies, things show up in, in surprising ways. And it was Mindy Kaling, who was nice enough to do the voice of Disgust. Um, uh, she came to Pixar and we were pitching her the story. And first of all, she was, <laughs> she was a little, I remember uh, asking her to play a character named Disgust. And she's like, really? And we said, no, 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 she's, this character is disgusted. She's not disgusting. She's beautiful. And, and, and then just like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> but anyway, she was sitting hearing the story and um, um, hopefully Mindy won't be watching this on line. But um, 
we were telling her the story. Pete was pitching it. Pete's such a great storyteller, and, and he was pitching the movie. Uh, and Mindy was, I was kind of watching her listen and react, and she started just like sobbing. And I mean, like really, really crying. Like so, so much so that I thought maybe she got like bad news on her phone or something. Like it was, I didn't, wasn't even sure if it was about the movie, but it didn't, turned out it was. And um, I think when Pete was done, I said, oh, gosh, are you, you know, you okay? And she says, no, I'm, I'm fine. That was just so great. And she said, I'm just really touched because it's, and I don't remember exactly how she said it, but she's, it was along the lines of, it's really powerful that you guys are making a movie about, um, that it, about little girls and that it's hard to grow up and that it's okay to be sad about it. And I remember we, Pete and I, and we sort of looked at each other like, oh my God, Mindy Kaling just took those two themes that we were debating and wove them together in this beautiful fabric. And we realized we didn't even know, know we were kind of doing that. And so, um, I guess the punchline of that is you never know. It's like the sense of discovery as you make these things. And, um, we were, we were so pleased and our writer, Meg LaFauve, um, she jumped in and, and, and I think crafted the, the, the screenplay kind of, kind of with that in hand. And I, th I think all those, all those things somehow went into a blender and came out with, um, a movie that we're, we're really proud of to this day. I'm, I'm really proud and I'm really proud that you're going to watch it and I hope you, you enjoy it. And there's a ton of little, little things along the way. There's little nods and, uh, nods to San Francisco and I remember even San Francisco one of the one of the ideas was uh, Ralph Eggleston our production designer because we were talking about wanting to set it specifically you know into I mean Pete Doctor grew up in Minnesota and came out west to California as a kid so it sort of echoed his his experience but it was Ralph Eggleston who who made a comment like San Francisco is a perfect city for this because it's literally a city under cables under wires uh, and we had this idea of things being connected in the mind and it, and the fog rolls in and impedes the city and buries it. And that those are even, these, these were sort of visual things we were playing with in the mind. And so some of the fantastic stuff that we were thinking about in the mind world, um, which, you know, it was like Oz, you know, there's sort of no rules. We could do whatever we wanted. We're somehow just naturally or, and organically being echoed in, in San Francisco. So we felt that really fit. And that's, kind of what informed some of those decisions. So, oh my gosh, I could talk forever about it. Um, the, the movie coming out ended up being one of the greatest, you know, times of my life. We were so proud when people responded to it. And, and uh, it's one of those things in life where uh, I feel so lucky from everything I learned at school, from everyone I met at Pixar, from all my experiences that we were able to make something that, you know, people felt honored the the beauty and difficulty uh, of of growing up and that's kind of as a fan of animation and disney and old movies that's everything i ever wanted to do so blah all that said i want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart uh for having me here tonight for hearing me go on and on about it because i really i really i really love it and um i love all of you and uh i guess i'll wrap up by saying go gators enjoy the show Thanks, everyone.